Joining us right now is Ray Dalio, Bridgewater Associates founder, co-chair, co-chief investment officer. Ray has a new book out. It's getting endorsements uh, by all uh, sorts of luminaries. It's called The Template for Understanding Big Debt Crises. It's out now, and we should tell you, this is the, one of the best kind of books. It's available for free. You can actually go online and download it for free as a PDF. You can also get it on your Kindle, and you get a hard copy uh, in October. Uh, but it's really a look at crises over uh, centuries, really, uh, and what policies uh, created the crises and what policies helped rescue uh, the world from them. So good morning to you. Thank you. Good for, morning. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, we're spending the whole week uh, really looking back at the 2008 crisis. But, uh, and, and by the way, during the midst of the crisis, we should say a lot, big pieces of this book, he was writing these memos every single day uh, that people like Tim Geithner and Ben Bernanke were reading that ultimately got crafted inside uh, this book. But when you look back and, and think about the crisis, what is the biggest single lesson? I know there's so many lessons in the book and we want to get to them, but the biggest single lesson for you? Well, <clears throat> of all of them, uh, there's the debt growth that finances, the bubbles that happen before it that create the busts. You know, there's basically six stages to it. There's the normal debt growth that finances growth that pays for itself. <clears throat> then you get into the bubble stage when everybody's extrapolating what happened in the past. So asset prices are going up and everybody's borrowing a lot of money to uh, extrapolate what's happened. And that bubble stage, central banks don't pay much attention to because it doesn't affect inflation and growth. And so I think at that stage is when the central bank should be looking at, are those debts going to be able to be paid back from the financial? That would be the biggest. Right. Uh, and what stage, therefore, are we in today? We had a segment on it around 6.30 with Brian Sullivan, who talked about actually how debt in this country has actually increased since 2008. Yeah. Debt has is, debt is increased, but uh, debt relative to the debt service, debt service payments relative to incomes have not risen like they have had in 2007 and, and eight. So his, his point was looking at corporate debt in particular. Uh, corporate right. debt, yeah. of course, is liver. But if you look at the corporate cash and you look at the right. maturity of the debt, when we run the pro forma financial uh, calculations, it's nothing like 2007 what looked like to 2008. There is a squeeze at, that'll be emerging. But uh, generally speaking, <clears throat> Uh, we're in, I would say, the seventh inning of this cycle. Um, I think that we're at the stage in the cycle where um, interest rates are being raised. Right. We're in the later stage. Probably maybe we have two more years, I would say, into the cycle, right. something like that. What? And then um, the, issues, <clears throat> the issues of this desk crisis are very different than, than the last desk crisis. Right. Each one's a little bit unique. This one looks very much more like the 1935 to 36, 35. 1935 to 40 period. You mean debt situation? You called it a crisis. crisis. We're, not, we're not at a crisis yet. Are we? Are we? Are, are we there now? No, but oh, I think, oh you well, mean the, the oh, debt okay. situation? Can I uh, can I describe the parallels? Yeah. Because I think the parallels Please. are really okay. important to understand. Okay. 1929 to 32, and nine and 2008 to uh, 2009. We have a debt crisis and interest rates hit zero. Both of those cases, interest rates hit zero, only two times the century. It, there's only one thing to do next, and that is to print money and buy financial assets. So in both of those cases, that's what the central bank did, and they pushed asset prices up. As a result, we had an expansion, we had the markets rising, and we particularly had um, an, ex an increase in the wealth gap. Because if you known financial assets, you got richer. And if you didn't, you didn't. And so what today we have is the, a wealth gap that's the largest since that period. The top one-tenth of one percent of the population's right. net worth is equal to the bottom 90 percent combined. You have to go back to 1935 to 40. As a result, we have populism. Okay, populism is the disenchanted. Capitalism not working for the majority of people. Then we, so we have that particular gap. So we have a political gap, the, um, a social gap in terms of the economics, and we're coming into the phase where we're beginning the, the tightening cycle. 1937, we begin a tightening cycle. We begin a tightening cycle at, at this point. No tightening cycle ever works out perfectly. That's why we have recessions. We get, can't get it perfectly. So as we're going into this particular t cycle, we have, um, we have to start to think, well, what will the next downturn be right. like? We're nine years into this. As you have a downturn, 
I believe that there's a political and social implications to that related to populism and less effective monetary policy. There's less effective monetary policy because there are, so far there are two types of monetary policy used. Lowering interest right. rates. We can't lower interest rates. And the second is quantitative easing. And it's maximized its effect. So I think that the next downturn is going to be a different type of downturn. I think pension problems, so, uh, health care problems in terms of obligations that are not funded, that more are not debt. More severe next time? I think it'll be more severe in terms of the social, political problems. And I think it'll be more difficult to handle. What, it, what won't you're be like the, it won't be li the same in terms of the big bang debt crisis. It'll be a, 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 a slower growing, um, more constricting sort of debt crisis that I think will have bigger social implications and I, a bigger international implications. But there, there's a sense in this book that there's inevitability to these crises. And so one of the questions is from a policy perspective, if we're in the seventh inning, is there anything that policymakers can do today, not afterwards, but today to avoid this crisis you're talking about? I, I think, first of all, uh, to be able to think about how to handle it, because you're right, they're inevitable. They're inevitable because th there's never the perfect balance between lending and borrowing, right? And so they're inevitable. Uh, I would say the things that they should do that maybe are missing are, first of all, to have the freedom of action. Um, we have a lot of regulations, and they're usually written for what the last death crisis was, was like, and ours are. But there are less freedoms of action today. We have a safer banking system, and we've done a lot of things to make it safer. But each one is a little bit different. It, classically, there's the development of the shadow banking system, and, the, right. and, and we will have a new type of shadow banking system, so less freedom. I think we have to think about what is the monetary policy three, as I call it, that is not going that when we have uh, quantitative easing not that, being as effective. That's what I mean. I mean, is, is the, and then the prescription, third would the prescription for that, though, yeah. be to raise rates now and try and unwind no, the balance no, no, sheet no, as fast no, no. as possible? Because that no, would bring because on. If you, raise, if you raise rates now, all the rate structure is affected and carries through all markets. Right. Because we're all discount. It's a discount rate for the present value of all asset classes. No, no, no. I think you have to start to think of what monetary policy three is, which is, um, you know, particularly in Japan, you're going to need it, but um, the type of thing where there's, it, it, it's not just the purchase of financial assets, it gets individuals to make their purchases right. of Ray, actual what if, assets. And, what if what we're seeing now is, is not uh, really transient in terms of the, the business conditions, and, and we continue to see this new corporate structure actually help in terms of capital formation for, for corporations, the 2.9% wage gains that we saw continues and d does the populist worries and concerns that you have for income inequality, could that ease if we went into a, a protracted period of, of good uh, economic growth? Um, I, I looked at the bottom 60 percent of the population, so to take out of the averages, and uh, for various reasons having to do with technology and other things like the so asset purchase. Are you going to tell me we're, we're screwed either way? Or, uh, uh, I, think that, I think that there should be a national initiative to look at um, the parts of the population that are not benefiting from the cycle. And I think that then, you know, education in many ways is just terrible. So uh, you're not talking about pure redistribution, you're not talking about universal basic income, you're not talking about any, any things like that. No, you you I, want to I, keep things going in terms of I the private sector. I think the most important thing is uh, the ways to create opportunity and productivity in that group. Yeah, we all and, want to do that. And, and yeah. because product, everybody needs to be. But it'd be productive. better to do that in a growth period. Do you have more money to try to do that with if, if the overall economy this is, is the growing? I think more this quickly. is the time. I, yeah. I think, imagine it. If you have a downturn, what will it be like? I mean, it's a basic principle that if um, you have a big difference in wealth and you share a pie, you divide the budget uh, right. in one way or another and you have an economic downturn that, pe that people are at each other's throat. But if you're growing at 3% for three or four years, if that were possible, which is 50% even more faster than we were growing previously, that throws off more money for education and for social programs to, to ameliorate what you're talking about, doesn't it? C certainly, certainly, okay. we know, but it doesn't solve the problem. Doesn't solve the problem, but you're in a... <laughs> I mean, I th if you, can, if you saying... choose one or the other, you'd want, you'd want growth. 
Oh, I want growth. Okay. That's why I, I, would, I, I would say the risks are so asymmetric. Much harder to solve the, the uh, income the, inequality I, problem when you're not growing. I'm sorry? Much harder to deal with the income inequality problem when you're growing at 1.7%, of course, and that's why as I we say, saw. And that's why I'm saying when the downturn comes, yeah, okay. and do you doubt that the downturn will come? Um, I don't want to, I, 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 when you say that it's inevitable we have another debt crisis, it makes me sad. Um, well, I didn't ask whether you're sad. I ask what, whether it's, they're it's disturbing. Okay. It's disturbing. I'm not sure how you, it, it almost is like you're saying human nature almost mandates that it, it happens. It, we over. We, 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 we get late in a cycle. We never we get the, the balance over exactly and over. right. We, we do the Let same me, things right. over and over again. And that's, that's what the book is about. The, if the, one thing I, the reason I, I, I wrote the book is not so much to talk about this one and, and so on. It's to show that um, they all happen in the same way. There's all the mechanics of the same way. Uh, there are six stages to it. We won't have the time to go through the six stages. Okay. But, but I'm saying that the same thing happens over again. If you take in this first 60 pages of it, and it's free, just read the first 60 pages of that book. Now, is and Too Big to Fail this, this new issue of Too Big to Fail? Can I download that for free, or you is can that? Download it on Kindle. You can buy it. But is it like even, Ray's book? I, is might it, even give, I might even sign your book for free. I'll do, sign your book for not, free. You're, you're avoiding my question. Is it free like Ray's book, or do I have to? Um, I'm a capitalist. <laughs> He's a philanthropist. <laughs> He's, uh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, let me, Ray, here's a policy question for you. One of the things you've, we've all heard from, from Hank Paulson, Ben Bernanke, and Tim Geithner is that they wish they could have articulated and communicated their, their policy responses better, and that there's a view that maybe if they did, somehow the popul uh, populism that we have today might be different. Do you think that's true? No, or do you think I think the majority of population is not watching your television show or <clears throat> and understands the communication. I think that they understand their experiences. And with those experiences, that produces But, uh, but when anger. you look at the policy responses, people you know, have talked about, would we we'd be better off if there was principal reduction? For homeowners directly, remember a lot of the resentment uh, uh, in the public came because there was a feeling that the money was going to the banks rather than directly to the homeowners who were who were in trouble. Or some of these other steps. You've looked at these different crises and and sort of how people feel about them afterwards. I think that over and over again, it's emotions and it's not logic. And when there's the polarity, sometimes it even gets you know it even gets violent. Um, you know, so um, I think it's emotions. When you say violent, we had a conversation. You talked about Pearl Harbor. Well, what I was referring to is um, that the conflicts that we have internally between the left and the right and those who have and those who have not also get elected populists. And then we also have international tensions. And so uh, when we had the Smoot-Hawley tariff and we had uh, uh, Japan rising as a power, Germany rising as a power, in much the same way as China's rising as a power. We had a situation where there were economic rivalries out in Asia. Mm -hmm. and, and so 1931 was when the Japanese invaded Manchuria and that they started to compete with resources. And that took 10 years, but 1941 was the bombing right. of Pearl Harbor. I'm saying that you're in a situation where also we have rising powers, China's a rising power, competing with the United States. And those tensions get carried forward there. And those are economic tensions of paramount importance. But those economic tensions um, produce um, right. conflicts in various ways. And that uh, everybody should be cautious How'd about that. How'd the uh, stock market do in 36 to 39? Not too good. Not too, not too good. So Fell over that 50%. What's, yeah. what's your current market commentary for? Uh, I don't. I, I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, it has anything like that. Okay. I think, I think. Uh, but overall, in general, how, how are you feeling? Is it fairly valued? Right now, right now, we have just gotten to the point in my judgment that it's um, more than, the risk return is more uh, negative. That now, uh, we've, that, that's we've gotten Phil, we, we've, we, we used to have a lot of, we talked the, at Davos. At Davos, I, I remember you said, that, said stay in. Of, but you were real of, comfortable, but you said stay in. This there was thing. a lot of cash on the sidelines. Yeah. A lot more of that cash has been deployed. 
Um, we have the benefit of the corporate tax cuts behind us. Yeah. And if we look at what's being discounted, what's being discounted is um, about right. In other words, if you look at the projected returns of equities relative to cash and bonds, um, the projected returns look you remember sort of you about told us right. In, but you, you, you the upside, the upside, the upside is a little bit is is limited yeah. relative meaning, to the others. Meaning you would pull money out of the market, or you just wouldn't deploy uh, the capital. Right now, whatever is more defensive, I would then be in a more defensive posture. Whatever your strategic asset allocation issue is, that uh, you know what your strategic mix is, right. I would be less aggressive rather than uh, yeah. more aggressive. He remembers what he told us in Davos, because I remember, and you remember too. That's You don't give that many interviews, I think, so you know exactly what you said, but that is accurate too. I was going to mention that. You weren't, I wouldn't call you rampantly bullish, but you said this is good and things are going to get better. But you had concerns even then, but the, the well, end of the, the cycle. I have concerns over a, a two-year time horizon. Yeah. If I was to take now and think over the next two years, that's where my concerns are. I'm not well, could we excited about Could we be where we now. are in two years? Could we consolidate for two years and stay here at these levels? Um, I think more than likely we'll be in the, these general vicinities for a while. Okay. Um, but as time progresses, the risks increase. Okay. What do you think the Fed should do right now? I think the Fed should make sure that it doesn't di raise rates faster than is discounted in the curve, right? Because there's an interest rate curve that, we, that calculates how fast uh, rates are going to rise. That rate curve is priced into all asset classes, into bonds, stocks, everything else. And so they should make sure that they're light, uh, the, you know, right. not quite as fast as the curve or equal to the curve, um, because asset prices are very sensitive. I think um, that was something you said as well. I, I was going to ask you about China. I consider you a bit of a China file, someone who spends a lot of time there and mm -hmm. knows the people there. What do you think is going on in their economy? There seems to be a lot of uh, debate and discussion. What, uh, you mean about what? About the debt restructuring, about the tariffs, about what? All of them. Trade. Yeah. Uh huh. Um, I think that the actual size of the tariffs and trade on the uh, Chinese economy is, is not that big a deal. And, that, you know, there's the $500 billion that they export. There's the size of that. They've got a giant economy and they can handle those types of things. So I don't think it's that big of a deal for them. I think the big deal is what the nature of the relationship is. Is this going to be a relationship in which there's sort of the give and take or is this going to be an antagonistic relationship? I think that that's m most you know, almost a warlike relationship. I don't like the, I don't think they like the term trade war as this right. thing from trade negotiation you, or dispute. You think it's warlike? Uh, I think that, the, that it is um, an exchange of painful acts and an intimidation kind of thing rather than uh, a negotiation of, you know, what do you need? How can I help you? How can you help me? So I think it's gotten on a footing that um, I, I think is discomforting to uh, to Chinese But there, uh, there would be people here who would say it's gotten uncomfortable because in this relationship negotiation that we've had to this point, Americans have fared less well. At least that's a perception in a lot of places. Do you think that's accurate? And is there a way to be a tougher negotiator without uh, maybe ruffling the feather? Yes, feathers so, quite as well? oh yeah. I think tough negotiations. Nobody is against tough negotiations. Every country understands that it needs to understand. It's the rhetoric. It needs to do what's best in their country. But the question is, I, th I think the real issue of China, um, a leader in China uh, described it as follows. He said, um, in the United States, that unit that matters the most is the individual. You are a country of individualists. You protect individual property rights in a certain way. If, um, and if you understand our mentality, we are a family. In other words, the word country in China, in characters, is state family. And he says, when we run the country, we think about um, how, think about how you, a head of a family, would run the family. So it's very much more from a top down. It's very much more hierarchical. So the notion of um, China Inc., in other words, uh, of course, there's almost a pyramid. And they think, at the head of the family, at the head of the government, they think, I'm go what is best for China and my Chinese companies? And so that approach, very much different from our approach, which is this bottom up. And it redefines so many things, how we handle data, how we handle each other, and so on. That's a very structural, uh, important difference. It works for them. 
And so their notion, um, will you have uh, the, the state-owned enterprises yeah. being helped by the government? What stage are and they how in? how will you compete in, in, For debt. in that? What stage are they in, in terms of uh, the six the, stages? The, 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 most important, the, the most important thing about debt is whether the debt's denominated in <clears throat> your currency or a foreign currency. <clears throat> if it's in your currency, you can manage it, just like we managed it. You spread it out and you move it around and you monetize some of it. Right. In their case, the debt is denominated in their currency, most of those currencies. So they're going to be able to manage that, I think, well. And uh, their, they, their corporate debt levels are high. They're going through the restructuring. But generally speaking, their debt levels are not as high as ours. And they're, one of the great things is that they're doing it before a crisis. We do it in a very reactive way. Um, and in their particular case, they know that they've got a debt situation and they're in the process of managing it. I think that they'll manage it just fine. I think they'll manage their economy just fine. I don't think we're going to have a, um, any big, uh, there'll be bumps along the way. There are recessions, slower growth, a little bit of that. <clears throat> but I think Ch China will be, I think the big issue is our relationship with China over a period of time. I hope it doesn't follow a path that is very similar to the U.S.-Japanese path, where the economic tensions, the competing for trade routes, the uh, competing for influence in different countries and all that, leads to an antagonism, leads to um, embargoes two, two, two and two so final, Two final quick questions. One on, on policy, which is uh, $21 trillion in debt in our country. Do you think that we, we, we can ultimately manage that? that that's one of, you know, people talk about too big to fail. Now they, that was in the context of banks. Now people talk about it in the context of the country or municipalities well, or cities. I, 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 yeah, I, I, I think that that's exactly right. If you, if you, while we don't have an immediate debt rollover like in the next year or two, we have a giant squeeze that's happening. And it's, um, it, it's not only because of the debts, but even more important, the unfunded pension liabilities, and, that's when it the, um, it, and the health care costs. And so we have a squeeze that's emerging. Right. We will, in two years, um, have, a, have the fiscal stimulation that we have pass, and we are going to be selling bonds, a lot more right. bonds, to the rest of the world. We are a reserve currency. And because we're a reserve currency, we're in the very priv privileged position of having other countries want to save our currency and buy our bonds. But that is going to be risked by the quantity of debt that we're Final going question. to deal with. Final um, question. Given that you've seen how policymakers have responded to crisis, how would you grade Hank Paulson, Tim Geithner, and Ben Bernanke? I'm going to see them tomorrow at, at, at the Brookings Institute. When you look at the, given, given the populism and, and all the issues that you've raised about where we are today. A or A plus. I'd give them A or A plus. I mean, like, I, I really do think, um, one could theoretically say you could have anticipated. We were able to anticipate it by doing these pro forma financial right. numbers and so on. But actually, who did? Now, raise your hand if you did. Hardly anybody did. So, uh, what, but once that point happened and they were operating in that political environment, the right. actions that they took, the speed at which they dealt with, um, all of that, um, led to the results that we now have. So, um, yeah, I think they did a great right, is job. There any, is there any income inequality problem in China that you see? What, what's, yeah, there's an what's income. What's the bottom six? Are we, is our bottom 60% uh, better uh, than their bottom, better off than uh, their bottom 60%? Their, 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 their income problem, income gap problem, is, worse is very ours. similar to ours. It's essentially almost the same as ours. Okay. Um, and it's, it's an issue. It's part of the development of yeah. the Western provinces and those types of things. But on the other hand, they don't have the same sort of political and social problems that, of dealing with it. You know? Yeah, they might deal with it a little differently. They deal with it a there. little differently. Yeah. Right. Ray Dalio, uh, the legendary leader of Bridgewater, author of the new book. You can go out and download it right this minute, A Template for Understanding Big Debt Crisis. We thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you.